Hello, good morning. Good morning, Warsaw. So awesome to be here. Clap yourself or whatever. Oh, I need that. My name is Ron. This is my partner, Lior. We are the new school. Thank you. I'm the clicker guy. Awesome. So I'm very excited to be here. Actually, a bit nervous to be the first one to speak at this awesome event in front of so many cool Polish people. And I will be talking about money. We will be talking about money. And this is definitely not me. I'm not very cool with money like that. And the reason that I'm not very cool with money like that is because I got into design not because I wanted to get rich, but because I was super passionate about design. I love this. I love doing it. Started as a hobby. And because I love doing it so much, it actually when I started out, I was willing to do this for free because, hey, I'm doing what I love. It actually didn't make sense or it didn't really feel right to take so much money for something that I enjoy doing. And I went to design school and they taught me how to design. They taught me about you know, typography, layout, color. They never talked about the money. So nobody ever taught me how to manage it, how to deal with it. And I actually want to share a personal story about how clueless I am when it comes to money or at least how much clueless I was. So, five years ago, I married this lovely lady and we got a bunch of wedding gifts, which means money. And I don't know if you have this uh, kind of ceremony in Poland, but in Israel we have kind of the counting of the check ceremony. So, the, you know, the day after the wedding, you wake up and you stay in bed counting all the checks. Uh, it's really fun. And so we were like, whoa, this is more money than we ever saw. So what will we do with all this money? And, of course, let's do what everybody that uh, knows how to make money does. Let's put it on Wall Street. I, and what do I know about Wall Street or choosing stocks or whatever? I'm a designer. The only thing that I know is that I have a cool MacBook and that I love my iPhone. So, let's take a look at the Apple stock. Oh, the Apple stock looks really great. It's been going on for like 30% a year for six years. How come nobody's talking about this, you can make a bunch of money if you buy some Apple stock. So I took all of my wedding money and bought Apple stock. Told my wife she was a bit nervous about this. I told her, we'll be doubling our money next year and buying a new house. This will be amazing. Five months after that, we kind of lost 30% of our money. Um, that didn't really feel very well. I became super, super anxious checking the stock price like seven times a day, reading financial news and stuff like that. Like, I couldn't sleep very well. So eventually after losing 30% of our money, which is like tens of thousands of dollars, I said, I can't deal with this anymore. So let's just sell it. My wife joked that I paid the tuition for a financial degree, but I got the degree really fast. And that's how I actually learned my first lesson in finance, which is super, super basic, you have to diversify. You never put all your eggs in one basket. And that lesson really hit me hard. I was working as a full-time employee designer back at the time, and I started thinking, am I putting all my eggs in one basket? What if this company goes bust? What if this company actually fires me? Do I have all my eggs in one basket? Maybe I should be diversifying. And that was actually one of the main drivers that uh, drove me to you know, go on freelance so I can work with a lot of clients and start the new school with Lior and Ayal, our third partner. Because I said, the more bets I make, the more diversified my income will be, the more secure I will be, and the more I have a chance to kind of make more money and be safer. So today we're going to be talking about how you can diversify the way that you charge your clients in order to be safer, but also try to maximize how much money you're making. We'll be talking about three pricing strategies, value pricing, retainers, and stock options. And for the first one, I'm introducing Lior, my partner, to talk about value pricing. Hey guys. I'm also excited. Okay, so number one is value pricing, and this is my favorite, because when I started doing uh, freelance work, I thought you should uh, only ask for, you know, per this hour, I'm going to ask for that much. And then I read somewhere that you can actually charge for the whole project. 
And this is called value pricing. And why do we call it value pricing? Because you pay for value, okay? So basically, there are two jeans, you know, pairs of jeans. They look the same, uh, almost the same. They might even made in the same factory or really next to each other. But we value this jeans much, much more. I mean, more than 10 times than this one. Why? Because of, you know, value that we give to this jeans. Not all of us, but some of us. Um, how it affects our image if we wear diesel and we think maybe that the design is better. Well, you're designers, you should value design. And the, the thing is that we value it more. So if you ask for money in according to the value of the project, and not just for your time, you could actually uh, have a very simple equation. The more value you create, the more you can ask for your project. So, to explain a little bit more about how, how we do um, value pricing, I have to introduce Professor Dan Ariely. You might know him from his TED Talks or his uh, most popular book, um, Predictably Irrational. And he's a behavioral economist. Okay, so what he does is looking at people and see how we take our decisions and actually most of the time just laugh because we take stupid decisions. We're not so rational like we uh, like to believe. And in one of his um, uh, stories, he tells about a really interesting ad for The Economist that he saw um, on The Economist paper for a subscription, okay? An annual or a monthly subscription for The Economist. And then something looked really weird, okay? If you look at these three options. So if you only want the online subscription, it costs you $59. If you want just subscriptions for the paper, it will cost $125. And if you want both, it costs $125. And this is, of course, really weird. Why would both of them cost just the same? So Dan Ariely is calling The Economist because he can call whoever he wants because he's Dan Ariely. And um, they tell him, we'll move you to the marketing guy, we'll move you to the sales guy. They just move him from a person to a person. No one gives him an answer. And then a month later, the ad just disappears. But he said, okay, I, I want to, do, to make an experiment myself. So he takes a group of 100 people and he shows them this and asks them, what would you choose, okay? And here are the numbers. So some people chose the online only, and then most people chose this option, okay? Which leaves, of course, 0% for the middle option, because why would you pay this if you can get this, right? Makes sense. Till here, we are super rational. But apparently, he took 100 more people and he showed them just the same with a little small change, okay? This time, he showed them only these two options. Can you guess what happened? It actually flipped, okay? Now, most of the people bought the online one and just a bunch of them bought this uh, higher uh, price subscription. How come? How come? I mean, if you look at it, again, the numbers are totally different, even though it's the same, uh, the, what you get is just the same. And this is because, again, we're humans and we're just irrational. And the way we see things, the way we're getting presented with options and, and with different uh, um, showing us what we're going to get and the values of it, we take totally different decisions. Okay, so just one more uh, example of the same um, thing. That uh, in a different uh, experiment, it's talking in, in, in a book called um, Pricing, and they took a, they went to a bar and they chose two different beers. Okay, uh, a little bit more expensive beer and a little bit uh, less expensive beer, and they saw what people are buying there. Okay, and these were the numbers. Most of the people chose this one over this one. Okay, by the way, you don't know this one because it's an Israeli beer. I changed the beers just so, uh, you know, to make an introduction. But then, the weird things started to happen, okay? Look at this. They said, what if we add a really, really cheap beer, okay? Made in whatever, and we'll bring it to the table. Will the numbers be the same? Now, I guess you guys are smart, so you already guessed that it's now totally different. Let's see what happened now. 
So now only 20% of the people, I remind you, it used to be 80 just a second ago, only 20% of the people chose this one, okay? We used to think that we like a specific brand of beer, etc., but apparently it's not just about the brand, it's also about the, the different prices. And then most of the people chose this one. No one wanted this one. And why? Because they're almost the same price, but of course this looks like a decent beer and this looks like a tuna can or something. Um, and then they tried it to the other side, okay? They added one more, even more expensive beer, which is this one, okay? And it was cost 340, and now again, everything changed. Okay, so it's amazing. Uh, it used to be 20% a second ago, and 80% five seconds ago, and now it's 85. So apparently, it's a lot about how the prices are presented to you, okay? now. One more thing about this, um, this beer, the most expensive beer, is what we call the Encore, okay? I'll speak about it in a second, but just before that, I want to tell you that we like to choose, okay? We don't like it when we have only one certain beer. We like to compare things, and this is us as humans. If we go to a store and we, we see just one pair of jeans, we, we feel like maybe we should go to a different store. When we get in a store and we see two or three different pairs of jeans, we want to choose between them and we might not go to the other store, okay? And you might imagine the analogy that I'm creating now for you, but you'll see it in a second. So what is this Encore? The Encore is the most expensive beer in the, in the last slide. The Encore is the thing that is really expensive. And now when we get in the store or when we get in the bar, we see it as something that makes other things look cheaper. So in this restaurant from New York, uh, up there, uh, you can see but up there, there's a, um, a seafood plate that costs $150, okay? Um, and then pasta somewhere here costs $30. Now you know that $30 for pasta is quite expensive, but when you see it after the first thing you saw on the menu, cost 150, now it looks kind of cheap, right? You're like, hey, I'll take this pasta and I'm, th that's a Bergen. But actually, if you go to Warsaw, you would never pay $30 for uh, pasta. And even in New York, you can find really good pasta for much less. So this is the, what's called the anchor. It's the most expensive thing that we compare to. Okay, so for these many reasons, when we create value pricing, the, in the value pricing option, we uh, really recommend, and we do it ourselves, I'll show you a real example from real life in a second, to make it three tiers, okay? Just like these three beers. So how do we do it? The first uh, pricing would be exactly what the client asks us to do, okay? Let's say, I don't know, to design a, uh, or to develop a website. The second one would be, how could we make it even more awesome Okay, even things that they didn't ask us to do, but we know that uh, it would make what they asked more awesome. And in the third layer, we give them totally different things that they didn't even think of, okay? But why would we do it, right? We're not trying to selling them something they don't want. The thing is that the more you know about the client and the more you know about the client's project, and the more you understand the client's purpose, like how you as a designer really help them do whatever they need, the more you have to offer, okay? So let's see a, a real example from my uh, former client. So this is the basic package, okay? I offered them um, exactly what we were talking about in the meetings. Um, he was kind enough and I asked him if it's okay if I show it in, a, in the slideshow. He said, fine, I don't mind. So it's all good. Um, and in this basic package, it's like a basic website that uh, uh, he asked me to do. The growth package, you see, it's a little bit more expensive. And here are some things that for us are obvious, like a Facebook page. But this client, he's um, 65 or 67, and he didn't even think about Facebook page because for him, it's, it's not that obvious uh, to make. On the high-end package, 
I, I added a little bit more features that, again, he didn't even uh, imagine that he might want, such as uh, audio, okay, to have audio, audio files inside the, this specific website, doesn't matter uh, right now what it is. And then I, I have different pricing. Now, the pricing here is not according to how many hours it will take me to, to do each of them, okay? The prices here are in according to the value for the client, okay? So, for example, this feature of the audio um, uh, for his web page, it would be very, very beneficial for him, okay? And when I talked to him about it, he really loved it. So, even if for me, it took only a few hours to add this, he values it, and I know that uh, um, it's valuable for him. And it brings me for, uh, to about one more excuse why pricing your time instead of pricing in value is really important. Because when you price it, um, when you price your time, and then let's say, if I price my time, okay, what the, the generic thing we do as designers, okay, and let's say that this, this specific custom audio takes me three hours to create. Now, when I was just a beginner, it took me 30 hours, okay? And now it takes me only three hours. So the fact that I, um, I am now much faster and more experienced with uh, being creative doesn't mean that I have to uh, get less money. You know what I mean? Okay, so here's the, the last thing that I wanna say about value pricing, okay? You really have to understand what your client's purpose, what they want to achieve, what is their project, why did they come to you, okay? So a client comes to you and say, I want a website or I want a logo or whatever. You don't just want to do it for them. The more you understand what is behind what they ask you for, the more you can give them, the more value you can provide to them. Also, the more skills you have, the more value you can give them. So in general, it's all about value, but value pricing is only one strategy uh, you can use. There are two more uh, strategies Ron is gonna talk about. They are more rare, but we want you to think about them as well uh, while you're pricing your work. All right, so the next thing we're gonna talk about is retainer client. And what retainer client basically means is that it, you have a relationship with your client in which you help them on a regular basis. So you're working, you have to dedicate a certain amount of time every week, every month. So for example, you're working with a specific client for two days every week or 30 hours per month. Why is this awesome? It's awesome because uh, value pricing is really good, but you never really know when the next client is going to arrive. So you kind of have this kind of risk of I'm not sure what's gonna happen next month. And a retainer client is a great way to reduce this risk because you know exactly that you have a certain amount of money coming in because you have a regular continuous relationship with a client. So it's very awesome for freelancers to know that they have you know, money coming in for sure. It's very relaxing. It also allows you to take more risk and more perhaps creative projects um, alongside this retainer client. So why would a retainer client, it's obvious why it's awesome for us, why would it be also awesome for your clients? Well, I do a lot of work in the tech industry, which means building website, building apps and stuff like that. And in that specific industry, usually, most of the times, the project that you're building is never really a project. So you're doing a website, there's always going to be the next version. There's always going to be continuous development of this project. And by having an ongoing relationship, you can keep providing value to your client on an ongoing basis. And this is great for them because your client doesn't want to have to look for a new designer every time he wants to fix his app, update his website, and so on. They want to keep working with somebody who they know they can trust and that they had good experience with. So this is really good for them. The other really important thing I think about retainer client is that it kind of reduces a conflict that we have when we price otherwise. What do I mean by that? So when you're value pricing, just like Lior explained, 
you have a project and then you set a price for it, you sign a contract and you, you start working on it. But what happens a lot of the time is one month into the project, the client says, oh, you know, I forgot to tell you, we also want to do this and that. And so you start thinking, okay, if I do that, do I charge more money? So I have to send a new proposal or do I do this and make less money? So your interest as a service provider is to work less hours for the money that you're getting paid and your client want to get for his money the, the best value that they can have for you. So there's a conflict. Imagine you're working on a project. Now you, you're halfway into it. You have an amazing idea of how to make this project 10 times better. But this will also require double your effort. So would you do this? Maybe not, because you don't want to make less money. So you might not even bring up this great idea of how to improve the project. So by working on a retainer, what happens is, let's say you're working on a project and you estimate it to three months. Your client comes up with an idea. I said, oh, I also forgot that I want this page. You tell them, that's fine. You know my monthly rate. We'll just work another month to do this. I have a new idea that I want to add to this project. I can pitch it to my client, tell them, let's do this great idea. It will take longer to make and it will cost a bit more money, but you know, we have an ongoing base. So let me give you a, a real example from a client that I've been working with uh, for years now. I've been working with, with a company two days a week. So the way I price it is pretty simple. Uh, I'm doing two days of nine hours. In Israel, we work nine hours a day, so that's 18 weekly hours. There are usually four uh, weeks in a month. Sometimes there is five, so this month is even more profitable. And then you charge your hourly rate. So that creates a fixed income that you know that every month I'm gonna have this income. And then I have, in this example, three days that I can do other project. I can take risk, for example, I started uh, the new school with Lior and Ayal because I knew I have a fixed income and then I can make other investments with my time and take other projects, more creative projects, more risky projects. So, how do you sell a retainer? Well, the way that I usually do it is something like this. A client comes over and they say, I have a project, I need an app. I ask them, okay, what is your deadline? I need it in three months. All right, so the way I do it, I say, I can deliver the project for you in three months by working on it two days a week, for this example. My fee is accordingly, so this will cost you, uh, let's say, $7,000 times three. If at any point you wanna add something, you know my monthly rate. So this, there is no risk on your end, you know how much you're, you're paying. If you want to stop this relationship at any point, we can just stop this relationship. But if you do really great work, and as I explained, it gives great value to your client when they have an ongoing relationship with someone they, that they can trust and with somebody that executes and does really great work. So I always start on a kind of a limited uh, scope. Let's start with three months and they always want to continue. So sometimes the scope might change, at least, for example, we finish the project uh, after three months and now they don't need two days a week, perhaps they need one day a week, perhaps they need five hours a month, so the scope of the retainer might change according to their needs, but they always wanna keep working on the long term. I've actually just recently decreased my amount of retainer because what's the, what's the con of a retainer? You're selling your time which is exactly what Lior told you not to do. Okay, and when you're charging for your time, it's really hard to say, I'm charging $2,000 an hour, right? You have to give something that they consider reasonable and they make research so they think there's some, you know, normal hourly rate. So it's really hard to charge super high prices for your time. So the thing with retainer is that it's lower risk. You know that you have an ongoing uh, income, but the reward is also lower because you're pricing for your time and you're not pricing for value. So recently, I had to decrease the amount of retainer that I have because I was working two days a week for a fixed income and I had a lot of projects coming in and they were like, I could price them really, really high and I couldn't take them because my time was you know, fixed on a retainer. So I recently decreased the amount of our retainer time so that I can do more value pricing. 
but how you mix your, your kind of portfolio of your client is, depends on, on your situation, of course. All right, so let's talk about the third option, which is the most risky, high-risk, high high-reward high option, and that is stock option. So stock option, what that means is that instead of getting cash in your hand, you actually get shares from the company that you're working with. The best example for this is uh, this guy who is the graffiti artist who painted uh, Facebook first office. Instead of taking cash, he took stock. That's now worth $200 million. So not every company that you're going to work with is going to turn out to be Facebook. But even if you're working with a company and your stock ends up being, you know, instead of $5,000, you're going to make $50,000 or $100,000, that's still a very, it's kind of a nice lottery card that perhaps you wanna hold in your inventory. So I would probably not do my whole, you know, when working with a, with a client, my whole uh, pricing for that project will be stock option. I will probably do something like 75% cash and then 25% of my, my reward would be in uh, stock option. So, so let me explain how that usually works. And I'm, pr I'm Pretty simplifying this for, for, uh, for this presentation, stock options is a bit more complicated, but it looks something like this. So with the client that I was working with, I uh, set up a contract to receive 2% of the company over two years with something that's called six months cliff. So 2% is actually, when you think about it, it's a lot. That's a lot of the company. Uh, but that's what, because I started to work with them really, really early on. And over two years, what that means is that every month that you're working, you get a little bit more of the percentage. The, and this is very, very common, especially in the tech industry, but also in uh, kind of public companies and big companies. So the reason that they want to give you stock options is because they want to have you motivated to work with them for the long term, and they want to have you invested in the company. So you want to, they want you to put your best effort so the company succeeds because you know that if, you, if the company succeed, you succeed. So that's their motivation. So it's usually what's called vested, which means you get the stock as the time passes. In this case, over two years, it's very also very common to do it over a four years period. And cliff means that if I, we stop working together in the first six months, I'm not gonna get anything. But after six months, I already have, in this case, uh, half a percent. And if we stop working after a year together, I will already have 1% of the stock option. So in, in the case of startup companies, stock options means that you will have the option to buy the stocks when the company succeed. In public companies or big companies, you just get the stock, and then perhaps they, there's something in the contract that say you can only sell it after a year or something like that. Again, stock options is a bit complicated. I suggest that if you wanna go into that direction, you learn a little bit about this. But again, I think it's very, very important, and not a lot of designers do this, because it's very, very um, worth your while to hold along with, you know, in the long term of your career to hold some of those lottery tickets that might end up, you know, increasing the value of your work 10 times, 100 times, and even more, and that, that stuff happens. So I wanna say one more word of caution about uh, <laughs> stock option because the most common thing is that some wannabe entrepreneur, crap entrepreneur will come up to you and say, look, I don't have any money to pay you, so how about I pay you uh, with stock options? When something like that happens, that's actually a red, red sign that you should not work with this person. Because people who are good entrepreneurs, who are really sure that their company is going to succeed, they do not want to give you stock options because they know that it's going to be much higher value than the money. They would rather pay you money and not. So usually, I have to actually negotiate for stock options. They wanna pay me money and I say, okay, look, I'll give you a discount on the money and have some stock options on the side. So if somebody wants to pay only stock options, I would be very careful, perhaps not to do business with this person. But if somebody wants to say, I'm just at the beginning of my business, I'm, I don't have 
a lot of money to pay super high prices at the moment, so I can pay you, you know, the, please give me a discount on the price and I will supplement that with stock option. That is very, very common and uh, perhaps can be a really great deal for you guys. So let's sum it up. So we've been talking about three strategies. The first one, value pricing. It's medium risk, and I say that the risk is medium because you never know when the next project is gonna come. And the reward is medium. The reward can actually be great. It's only medium in compared to what can happen in cases like stock options where it's like a million times higher reward. The second thing we talked about was retainer, which means the risk is low because you know the money is coming in every month, and the reward is a bit lower because you're pricing by the hour. And the third one, stock options, very high risk, but the reward can be very, very high. Now, I suggest that you mix it up and keep stock options not more than perhaps 5% of kind of your mix of income, but uh, it really depends on who you are. You know, just like investment, there's kind of a profile of who you are, how, how, risk, how much risk do you want to take, how much reward do you want to take. So for example, as I've said before, I used to work for the last two years, I've had retainer client for kind of half of my week, and half of my week was kind of higher risk, either my business or uh, clients that I value priced. Now I kind of moved into a higher risk where I decreased my retainer, but I'm at this position right now where I'm willing to take risks. So you have to understand who you are at this moment. Are you in a position that perhaps you need to be on a very low risk because you have, I don't know, kids and you have to pay the mortgage and, and you can't take huge risk at the moment? Perhaps you can do like three or four days of your week with retainers. And that can be really great for you. Or you're in a position where you want to take more risk. So mix it up. What happened to that Apple stock? Well, obviously it's almost double what it was when I sold it, so if I would just hold it, I would double my money. So uh, that kind of sums up the, the lessons here. First, you have to diversify. But the second, you also have to think long term, right? We're all, I'm looking at you guys, you're all young people here. So you have a long career ahead of you. So don't always think about what's gonna happen next month. Okay, we, we all need to pay the rent next month, but you also have a long career and you wanna invest in that. So do things that are a bit more long-term. Thank you very much. Um.